Welcome to episode four, the final episode in our introduction to dependency injection series. In this episode, we're going to use the very popular and one of our favorite uh, third party frameworks, the Spring framework, to automate the process of creating and injecting object dependencies. Prior to this, our, in our previous two examples, we were using manual techniques where the creation and injection of objects was done solely within our code. Now the Spring Framework will take over that responsibility. In addition, we'll be eliminating the service locator. There's no more need for it because Spring will take care of that. And we'll also eliminate any other hard dependencies on input and output implementations. Finally, we'll provide a means for configuring these implementation choices external to the application using the Spring Framework's XML configuration file format. So let's get started. We'll begin by examining the message service class. Now this class in this example four is very similar to the one we used in example two. Notice there are no hard dependencies, that is dependencies on concrete classes. We only have weak dependencies or dependencies and abstractions. So message service is dependent on message input, which is an interface, and message output, which is also an interface. There are no other hard dependencies. Therefore, this class is very flexible. We can inject different kinds of input objects and different kinds of output objects, and we can do that without having to modify any of the code in this class, making it much more flexible and portable. Now, to be fair, this class um, isn't uh, all that different from the previous example where we used a, a service locator. Here's the previous example. Notice that, once again, we have dependencies on these abstractions for input and output, but we also have a dependency on this service locator class. The service locator is the, is the class that actually finds and injects the input and output object. Now, to be fair, um, we could have done this work right here. We could have done this work somewhere else. For example, we could have done this work in the startup class. And if we had done that, um, we could have injected these objects using either the get the setters or the constructor, uh, if we had a constructor that accepted parameters. Um, and this class would have also been very flexible. So using a service locator does not mean you have to make your um, class uh, highly dependent on um, concrete objects. Uh, we just wanted to show you that you could encapsulate the functionality of the service locator within the message service class, uh, thus simplifying the use of the class. However, this does add a de the dependency on the service locator. But regardless of where you locate the service locator, whether it's here or in the startup class, you still have to maintain this code. This is still code that you have to write and it's still code that you have to maintain. So our goal is to is A, get rid of the dependency, and B, get rid of the class entirely. Why should we have to do that work? We have more important things to do. And that's where Spring comes to the rescue. So we're going to use this version of our message service class that has no hard dependencies. And we're going to use Spring to not only inject the dependencies, but also to instantiate many of the objects that we're going to need. So we call this an automated approach because Spring automates not only the creation of the objects, but also the injection of the objects. Whereas before, we did all the work either by using service locators or by using other techniques where we had to write the code ourselves. To use Spring, you'll need to add the Spring library files, these are jar files, to your project. Now, I'm using NetBeans here in this example, and NetBeans has built-in support for Spring, so all we have to do is right-click on the libraries folder and add the Spring libraries um, from our selection box. We could also add them in manually by using the Add Jar or Folder selection. If you're using some other IDE, for example, Eclipse, it has its own uh, techniques for adding the jar files. So the first thing you have to do is add the Spring jar files. Now, 
it's beyond the scope of this presentation to tell you exactly which jar files. There's quite a few of them that you're actually going to need. But um, uh, there's ample documentation on the Spring website uh, for that information. Okay. Now, this is an XML file called the applicationcontext.xml file. The name isn't all that important. It could be anything you want. It could be Spring config. Um, however, application context uh, is, is sort of the default name for this file. And it has some advantages when you're doing web development. I'm not going to go into those advantages right now. But I'm just going to use the default name applicationcontext.xml. And in this file is where you configure uh, the objects that you want Spring to instantiate and the uh, dependency injection that you want Spring to perform for you. So the XML file begins with a series of namespace entries. And these are um, these give us the ability to use these XML tags. Now, again, the exact namespace entries that you need are going to vary with the kind of work that you're asking Spring to do. And the coverage of the namespace entities is also uh, amply covered on the Spring Web site documentation page. So let's get right into it. Here we have um, a bean. Now, in Spring terminology, a bean is just an object. This particular bean uh, is going to refer to our message service class. Now, notice that we're using the fully qualified domain name in front of the class name. So this is the fully qualified name of this class. And, the, and that means we're using the package name followed by the class name. So we reference the class that we want Spring to instantiate. We give it an ID, which is really just an alias. And then we indicate what type of object we want Spring to create. A singleton is the default, and that means that Spring will create one and only one instance of this class. If we switch to prototype, then Spring will create a new instance every time we ask for the object. So let's stick with singleton for now. It's not really important. We're also going to want to inject some properties. Now, the, if you recall, our message service has two properties, message input and message output. We're going to inject these using the setter method. So we call this setter injection. The way this works is you indicate the properties as nested tags within your bean definition. This is the actual name of the property. And this is a reference to another bean, as you can see down here, that Spring will instantiate those objects as well. So we've got our, we've got our random message provider, our council message output. These are, just, these are just concrete implementations of the input and output classes. So what we're saying here is, Spring, we want you to instantiate an object of uh, this type, and we want you to inject it right into this property. So this reference, or ref, points to the ID of the bean that we want to inject. It's that simple. That connects this object to this object. And we do the same thing with the output. Okay, so that's how you tell Spring what you want it to do. Now, it doesn't do anything until you ask for something. So here's the startup class. Notice that at the top, we have an application context variable declared. And we're going to, and that's a generic version of a, a various, there are various types of application context classes that Spring provides. They all have different uses. The one we're going to start out with is the class path XML application context. And this class takes as a constructor argument the name of our configuration file. This file must be loaded on the class path. And that's exactly where it is in our project. It's on the class path right at the root. Now, that's not the best place to store a configuration file because when you store it within the application, you cannot modify the way the application behaves without recompiling the application. However, we could also use an external configuration file, and then we'd be using the file system XML application context instead of the class path. 
But for this demo, it's just easier to use class path. Okay, so once we've instantiated a application context object, it's that context object that gives us access to the various beams that we configured previously. Remember, we configured these beams in the configuration file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the context object to get me a beam. And I simply use the ID name. So again, the ID is like an alias that describes our beam. So I simply ask for the service class. Now I don't have to ask for the input and output objects because Spring has already created them and injected them into the service class. So all I have to ask for is the service class. Now I do have to cast it to a message service object because if I otherwise it comes out just as a plain vanilla. So now I have my message service. And now I can simply ask it to display the message. And that's all there is to it. So to review, declare your beams, give them an alias as an ID, declare, reference the classes using the fully qualified names, and then inject the objects you want by nesting property elements within the class that you want the objects to be injected. And that's all that's to it. By the time we use this, by the time this message service object is created, it's already got the input and output objects injected, and we can go ahead and use it. So now you can see that we've removed dependencies on the concrete classes. We no longer need a service locator class, and we no longer have to maintain that. However, to be fair, we do have one dependency, and that is we are dependent on Spring. In other words, if we stop using Spring, this isn't going to work. But in this author's view, that's a trade-off I'm willing to make because Spring is doing a lot of the work that I had to do earlier by writing and maintaining the service locator. And Spring is simplifying my code by allowing me to simply concentrate on using the high-level class, the service. But the best part is that at any time, I can reconfigure my program to use different input and different output classes without editing any source code or recompiling any code. So all I have to do is change this class name to a different class name, and I'll be using a different input object. And Spring will automatically inject it into the service class. So there you have it. Have fun with, with Spring.